The topic of unity is a very important topic in the life of the church. But of course, when we mention unity, we have to immediately be very clear in our minds as to what is meant by Christian unity. What's not being said is giving up the truth of what God's Word says just to get along with others. That's not Christian unity. What is Christian unity? Well, the very first thing to remember when it comes to Christian unity is it's not actually something we can create. Christian unity is not something that we here at Emmanuel Baptist Church can rally together strategically and make. We can't actually make or create Christian unity. Christian unity is something that is actually made by God. It's something that He gives to His church. He makes us one in Christ. So Christian unity is simply believers being granted the blessing of something they share in common with each other. And what is that unity that God has given to all of His people? The unity that God has given is that all those who are believers have been chosen by God. They have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. They have been forgiven of all their sins. They've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. They have the hope of heaven before them. These blessings are something that all of God's people in every place share and enjoy. So though we can't make unity, we are called to maintain unity. God unifies His people, but it is upon us in our responsibility to see to it that we are experiencing that unity and seeing that unity. Secondly, what threatens Christian unity? What is it that gets into the life of believers? What is it that breaks in to the church and threatens and destroys unity in the life of the church? Well, the answer is uh, two things primarily. Number one, the threat of false teaching. When false teaching raises its ugly head, it, it begins to bring a division and can cause disunity. But secondly, and the most prevalent, the greatest cause of disunity in the church is personal sin. When we are selfish and conceited, when we put ourselves first and neglect others, we will experience disunity. The final question I want to ask then is, well, how can we strengthen our Christian unity? What can we do as the people of God to experience and taste the beauty of Christian unity? And this is a really important question because, as I said right at the beginning, Christian unity is really important in the Scriptures. It's so important that the Apostle Paul was prepared to go to prison for Christian unity. Christian unity is so important that Jesus was willing to leave the glory of heaven and have our sin heaped on Him and die at the cross so that you and I would be one. Unity is important. So we ought to be committed to the task of asking and answering the question, how can we, as a church, specifically, how can we as Emmanuel Baptist Church be committed to the blessing of strengthening the unity in our congregation? Well, that is answered by the passage that we're going to look at this morning. Our focus is on Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 3. But what I want you to notice about these verses is these verses appear in a, a larger section, and that is verses 1 through to 16. And those 16 verses are all about the theme of Christian unity, and we'll be looking at that in the weeks to come. But before we 
delve right into the text this morning, I want to point out a significant thing, and that is the first two words of our passage. Paul begins by saying, I, therefore. And this is very important because this is a turning point in the book of Ephesians. Paul's letter to the Ephesians really is broken up into two main sections. Section number one is chapters one to three, and the second is chapters four through to six. In the first three chapters, Paul has been laying a foundation, and the foundation has been concerning the great doctrinal truths concerning the riches of our salvation. But with this word, therefore, Paul transitions to now discuss the theme of applying those rich doctrinal truths to the Christian's experience and practice. Uh, One way of saying it is that what we have in the first three chapters is doctrine, and the last three chapters is duty. We're going to begin this discussion of the Christian's duty. We could ask the question, knowing what we know from the first three chapters, how then should we live in this world? And Paul answers that by saying that you are now to walk in a particular way. How should we walk? Chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. You should walk in unity. Secondly, verses 17 through to 32, you should walk as a new person. Chapter 5, verses 1 to 7, you should walk in love. Chapter 5, verses 8 through to 14, you should walk in light. And then chapter 5, verse 15, all the way to chapter 6 and verse 9, you should walk in wisdom. And finally, chapter 6, verses 10 to the end, you should stand strong. That's how the final three chapters of the book of Ephesians unfolds. And what I want you to notice about this unfolding is the emphasis is on the Christian walk. This is how you should walk. If the first three chapters were about the, the wealth of our riches, the last three chapters are about the walk that we are responsible to live. But we're going to focus on this subsection of unity this morning, and that is the first three verses. So with this, we we come back to the question, and that is, how can we as a church strengthen our unity? Remember, we are actually unified as Christians. We do share things in common with one another. And it's all the blessings that we've been looking at in the first three chapters. But what can we be doing as a church to strengthen our unity. That is the theme of these three verses. And that is answered by the following headings that we're going to consider. I want you to notice in verse 1, we see that we can strengthen our unity, number one, by prizing unity. Number two, pursuing unity. And then number three, in verse three, um, preserving unity, prizing, pursuing, and preserving. So let's look at these one at a time, and as we look at each of these, I want you to see that Paul is carefully and passionately arguing that we as the people of God have the responsibility to strengthen the unity in our church. This is the great therefore. Because you have been saved, because you've been placed into the church, we as a church are to be committed to tasting and experiencing unity. And that begins by, first of all, us prizing unity. Notice what Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Now, I want you to notice something really interesting about Paul as he calls upon the people of God to prize unity. Notice where he is when he writes this. You see it, don't you, in verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. 
Uh, Quickly for a moment, go back to chapter 3 and verse 1. Paul said, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles. Uh, Chapter 3 and verse 13, therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. The apostle Paul is in prison, and the reason he's in prison is is because he is committed to his calling. He has been called by the Lord to preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to Jews and Gentiles, so that when they repent of their sins, they form one family. A unity is formed of people from different ages and different backgrounds. And as they come together as one body, forgiven of their sins, Paul has been committed to the task of proclaiming that message and preaching that message. And as Paul has been sold out to the will of God in proclaiming this wonderful message of the gospel of Jesus Christ for Gentiles, Paul has now been imprisoned. So there is this sense of seriousness in which Paul says, when it comes to the blessing of unity in the church... A diverse bunch coming together with the common experience and blessing of being forgiven. I am prepared to go to prison for this, says Paul. And with this heart of passion, Paul pleads with the church. I want you to notice that there is actually a tone of urgency packed in to his words. Paul says here that I beseech you. This word beseech carries with it a tone of urgency. The word beseech really could also be translated as I urge you strongly. I exhort you. There is a passionate plea behind these words. What Paul is saying here is not just a suggestion to the church. No, this is consuming passion for him. Paul is shaking his chains in which he is shackled with, and he says, Ephesian believers, I have been laboring to show you all the riches that have been showered down from heaven on you. You were chosen before the foundation of the world. You were redeemed by the blood of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is now living inside of you. You have been sealed for the day of eternity. You were once walking like the Gentiles, but now you've been made alive And God has created something amazing. It is the church, and the church consists of a group of people around the world who have experienced those same blessings, and they all share Christ as their head. They are one, says Paul. Knowing this to be true, he says, on the basis of all of that, I beseech you. I urge you. What what is it that Paul is strongly pleading with this church to know and do? He says, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. This is stunning. The calling that they were called with is referring to the fact that we were once in darkness, but we're now in light. We were once unforgiven and we are now forgiven. We were enemies of God and we are now his children. That's what we've been called to. That is our calling. And Paul here is saying that I want your walk to match your calling. And you see the word that he uses there, I want your walk to be a worthy walk. That word worthy actually means to balance something. The idea here is that you've got scales, and on one side of the scales is your calling, what God has called you to. He's called you to be saved. And on the other side of the scale is your walk. That is the way you live your life. And Paul's saying that your life is to match 
your calling. We need to remind ourselves of this constantly, that if you are a child of God, you have been called by God, and your conduct is to match your calling. And that's what Paul is saying here, is I don't want your life to be out of balance. God has called you, so live in such a way that your life matches your calling. This word, worthy, displays that our walk is to be on display in such a manner that it is fitting, that it is appropriate to what our calling is. And what is our responsibility when it comes to our walk? Well, in these 16 verses, Paul is saying the way you have a worthy walk, the way that you match your calling is that you, in your experience, match the reality of the unity. In Christ, you are unified with other believers, and Paul is saying, so I want you to live like that. You might live in a way in which there is disharmony, but that disharmony doesn't take away from the fact that you are still actually one with other believers in Christ. You might not just be experiencing it. It might not look that way. And Paul is saying, I want your life to be a picture of what is the reality. I want your life to match what Christ has done for you in bringing you near to the Father and bringing you together in the family of God. So the very first thing we need to be mindful of is if we're going to strengthen the unity in our church, we first of all need to passionately prize unity. We need to realize that Christian unity actually matches our calling. Do you prize unity? Do you actually take time to think about the fact that, yes, I have been called by God into the family of God? I belong to a a group of people bigger than myself. I belong to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that church, there are going to be people from different cultures. There are going to be people of different ages and different personalities. And I am going to be committed to the task that I will prize that unity and I will not do anything that will spoil that unity. Isn't it sad when we allow petty things to break up the beauty of what God has called us to? God has called us to be in the church, yet we can create little groups within that church. We can create barriers within a church. We can shun people in a church. And Paul is telling us, he is telling his readers that we are to remember that we have been called, and as a result of being called, we have the responsibility to live, and our living, our conduct, is to match our calling. So the very first thing that we need to do is we need to learn how to prize unity. Unity is precious, and it's to be prized in the life of the church. It's only when you prize something that you are committed to protecting it. Only when you recognize the value of something that you are careful with it. And this is the first thing that you need to see. A life lived in unity is a life that is actually matching our calling. We now come to the second point, and that is if we're going to strengthen our unity in the church, we must not only prize unity, but secondly, we must pursue unity. We have a responsibility to start taking steps in our walk, and we are to prize certain virtues. And that's what you see here in the first half of verse 2. There's three virtues that Paul lists that will help strengthen us as a church in being unified. Let's have a look at these words. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering. These three words are the virtues that are to characterize every believer. And when we are committed to pursuing these virtues, we will begin to experience the blessing of unity in the life of the church. Interesting, when we look at these words, 
we see a number of passages that will mention them, but it will also mention what the opposite of them is. And I think it might be helpful just to look at a couple of these passages because when we recognize the opposite of these things, we begin to learn that these opposites are the very things that are going to destroy unity in the church. And we begin to recognize that when the opposites of these three words are in operation in our own lives, we can begin to see and understand how we are contributing to disharmony. And where there is division, where there is disharmony, it can result in discord and divisiveness and even fracturing of relationships. Let's look at a couple of passages that references these terms but gives us an opposite. I go over to the very next book, Philippians chapter 2, and let's have a look at what Paul writes here in verses 2 to 3. The Apostle Paul writes, Fulfill my joy by being like minded. That's unity. Having the same love being of one accord, of one mind. But here it is, verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. The opposite of these three virtues is selfish ambition and conceit. A selfish ambition is when I Put my priorities and my passions first. When it comes to this church, it's what I want and what no one else wants. That's what comes first. Now, don't quote me on that. I wasn't saying that's a good idea. But that's what selfish ambition is. Selfish ambition is putting our passions, our priorities first. And Paul there in Philippians 2 says that's the opposite of lowliness of mind. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 5. And at the end of verse 5, Peter says, Be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Uh, The word that ultimately summarizes the opposite of the three virtues that Paul mentions here is pride. And when we are in love with our three most favorite people, me, myself, and I... We are destroying unity in the church. That is the greatest threat to the church's unity, is pride. When we are full of ourselves, when we have an estimation of ourselves that is greater than it ought to be, when we become so pride-filled, our heads get so big, we can't actually fit through the doors coming in. And this is what Paul is calling for against. He is saying in verse 2 that if we are going to experience unity in the life of the church, we need to be committed to these virtues. So let's quickly look at them one at a time. We need to, first of all, be a people who are committed to lowliness. This word simply conveys the idea of, of one who is deeply humble. Lowliness is a very literal translation. It is one who does not view themselves high, but brings themselves low. They recognize that all that they have is by the grace of God. A lowly person remembers that I was once dead in my trespasses and sins. I once walked according to the world, but it was God who saved me. It was God who transformed me. The lowly person remembers that and doesn't forget where they've come from. A lowly person doesn't forget that they are saved by God's grace and God's grace alone. Secondly, Paul adds the word gentleness. If we are going to be a unified people, we must not only be a a lowly people, a humble people, we must be a gentle people. This word gentleness could also be translated as meekness. It's a little bit of a difficult word to translate in just a single term, but the idea behind this word gentleness is it's the opposite of a harshness. 
It's very easy to have a short fuse. It's easy to get frustrated and annoyed and harsh and short with people. And Paul here is saying that if we're going to strengthen the unity in the church, we need to be a gentle people, a meek people. Of course, when we hear the word meek, it's often associated with the word weak. But meekness in Scripture is not weakness. Meekness and gentleness in Scripture is actually self-control. It is having great strength and able to restrain it when put in a pressured situation. The same word has actually been used of taming a horse, a horse that has so much power and strength, yet a tamed horse holds it all back. This word was used to describe Moses in the book of Numbers, the meekest man on earth, but Moses was no sissy. That man had a lot of strength, didn't he? And even more impressive, this word is used to describe our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the greatest example of one who had all power under control. And when he unleashed his fury and anger, it was righteous. It was never out of control. And what Paul is saying here is that if we're going to experience unity, we've got to have that self-control as the people of God. We've got to be able to be angry at what we ought to be angry and not angry at what we ought not to be angry at. We ought to be gentle. We ought to be meek. And then he adds the word long-suffering. Literally means to suffer a long time. It means to be put in a situation that is difficult and we will experience the suffering and hold up under it for a long period of time. It could be translated patient. When we bring these three words together, I want you to notice that Paul says that we're not just to try to be lowly, try to be gentle, and try to be long-suffering or patient, but notice he says we're to do this with all lowliness, gentleness, and long-suffering. The word all there is emphasizing that we must make every effort, not just a little bit of patience and gentleness in the church, but we are to be sold out to this. So the challenging question we need to ask when we are confronted with these three virtues is when you examine yourself, when you look at your life, be it in the quietness of your home, be it in the thoughts that you have in the life of the church of the Lord Jesus, are you a lowly person? Are you gentle and are you patient? Or are these areas that you're struggling with, are you viewing yourself higher than you ought? Is pride sneaking in and puffing you up? Are you a person who has a very short fuse and you're just getting frustrated and annoyed by all sorts of little things? Are you impatient? Well, we need the Lord's grace and help to correct us in these things. We will all do well to come before the Lord and confess our sin. We will all do well to be reminded that when these things are not on display, all sorts of problems begin to break out. This is the beginning of any difficulty in any relationship, in marriage, in parenting, in friendships, in work, and in the life of the church. When we allow the ugliness of pride, selfish ambition and conceit to rise their ugly heads in any situation in our life, we will begin to experience the beginnings of a fracture that can result in division. And Paul implores his readers that you are to pursue all lowliness and gentleness and long-suffering. It's actually a very interesting thing that the word lowliness, the first one there, is a word that doesn't appear in any literature before the New Testament. And there's a few theories as to why that is the case. Did Paul coin the word here? Others think it's because this was a virtue that was disregarded 
by the secular world. And we know that to be true because after the book of Ephesians, the word does appear in secular, secular literature, but it's not used as a virtue. It's used as a weakness. And Paul is being so counter, um, countercultural here, Paul is actually saying something that the world does not prize. The world is all about standing up for your rights, sticking it to them, showing them how it is, owning others displaying power over other people, bringing other people down. All those things are just so foreign to the Word of God. They're so foreign to a person who has been born again. Such attitudes might sound tough and impressive in the world. They might get a lot of hits on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or whatever. But none of them are pleasing to the Lord. None of them mark and characterize a man or woman of God. The church is to be characterized and marked as Christ was by lowliness and gentleness and long-suffering. Interestingly enough, the word long-suffering is also used of God in Romans 2 and verse 4 concerning the way he treated you. God was long-suffering toward you and patient. Could you imagine if the very first sin you committed, the Lord said, enough, and just obliterated you? He would be just to do that but he wasn't. He was long-suffering toward you while you're his enemy, while you were living your way, indulging in your lusts, in your desires. God was patient. And his patience was on full display in your life, whether you knew it or not. And that patience, coupled with his goodness, is what led you to repentance So we begin to learn that we are going to be like our Lord when we are gripped by lowliness, gentleness, and long-suffering. In our church, we need to be like that with one another. Yes, there will be people who irritate you. There will be certain things that won't be your preference. People will have ways of doing things. Some people will be quirky to the point of annoyance. But we are to be gentle. We are to be patient. We are to be long-suffering. Because even when those things might not always be the right things that they're doing, these virtues will be something on display that creates an opportunity for us to lovingly come alongside and minister to them. We now come to the final point this morning, and it's seen in the second half of verse 2 and verse 3 And that is, if we're going to strengthen unity in the life of our church, we need to be committed to preserving it. It begins with a prizing, it follows up with a pursuing, and then we need to preserve. Let's look at what Paul writes here. He gives us two actions. He says, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You see the two actions, we are to bear with one another and we are to endeavor to keep the unity. Let's look at the first action that we are to be committed to. We are to be bearing with one another in love. Now this word bearing could legitimately be translated as tolerate. Uh, We need to learn how to tolerate one another. But if we just left it there, that's actually not very helpful because we don't want to have the attitude that when someone in the church is different to me, if someone does something differently, if there are secondary matters that they do that I'm not in full agreement with, if we were to just simply conclude, well, it's my duty to just toughen up and tolerate them, that type of hard attitude can actually be insensitive. And it can actually come across in the way that we distance ourselves from people. When you tolerate someone, you don't get close to them. When you just merely tolerate someone, you stop looking at them. When you tolerate someone, you are just simply holding them at arm's length and you're not allowing a life on life to begin to be experienced. Paul here calls upon the believers to tolerate one another, but notice he quickly adds another phrase. You are to tolerate one another in love. You are to put up with each other. 
You are to deal with one another. You're to bear with one another. You're to tolerate one another, but it's to be done with love. What does it mean to do something like this in love? 1 Corinthians 13 and verses 4 to 7 describes for us most beautifully what this looks like. How can we bear up with someone who might be annoying or different or frustrating us for various reasons in love. Paul writes, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now that pricks my heart. That's what it means to bear with someone in love. Love in the New Testament is seeking the highest good of the other individual. We will do well to remember that if we are a people who've experienced the wealth of riches from God, then the way we match our calling is to walk in such a way that when it comes to the church, we are going to do all we can to bear with one another in love. May that be your prayer. Lord, help me to bear with those who think differently to me in love. This is an action that we are to be committed to. And where there is the commitment to the preserving of the bearing of one another in love, there will be the taste and experience of unity in the church. We are to bear with one another in love. Secondly, Paul says that we are to be endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. This word, endeavoring, contains an idea of diligent effort earnest effort, laboring, striving is what's behind this word. When Paul says that we are to endeavor to keep the unity, notice he says the unity of the Spirit. The unity is already there spiritually. We are one. But Paul says it's on you in the church to do all you can in your ability, in your situation, to see to it that the unity will be experienced in the church. If you're at conflict with another person, what are you doing to endeavor that the unity of the Spirit is kept? I want to again stress the word endeavoring reveals that we have an effort, a responsibility. It's on us to make sure that we are striving to do all we can to experience and taste unity in the church. When we see anything that might break through in our own lives, be it pride rising its ugly head within us, we are to confront that before the Lord and ask Him to forgive us for our pride, forgive us for our selfishness. When we see pride rising its ugly head in the life of our church or the rise of false teaching, we are to see to it that those things are to be removed so that we experience unity. How do we do this? Well, Paul says that you are to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The word bond can be used of a rope or a tie. And the idea is that what ties all this together, what holds us all together is peace. When peace surrounds us, peace is like a rope that ties us all together and holds us together as one. So how can we have peace? How can we make sure that peace is surrounding us? Well, one of the ways I like to think of it is this. When I think of a situation where I am either in conflict with another person or struggling with what another person is doing and I am wanting unity to be the outcome, I think of the word peace and make it an acronym. First of all, I use the letter P. I am to make it my motivation to please Christ in this conversation. It's not about my way or their way. It's about pleasing Christ. Secondly, the letter E. 
I need to examine myself first. Is there something that I haven't considered? Am I being prideful? Am I being sinful? And after I examine myself, I go to the letter A, and that is I ask God for wisdom. Lord, help me as I seek to speak with this person and meet with this person. And then I go to the letter C, and that is I carefully approach that person with gentleness. Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2. And as I carefully approach that person, E, I endeavor to do all I can by God's grace to make sure that there will be a peaceful outcome. And that really is summarized by everything that Paul has just said in the previous verse. If you are going to experience unity, you need to be committed to the pursuit of lowliness, gentleness, and long-suffering. You see, there are some things that we will always do well as God's people when we're annoyed with each other to just simply allow love to cover a multitude of sins. But when someone's sinful patterns begin to characterize them, It is on us to carefully confront another person. But it's not to confront them so you can own them, so you can expose them. You want to do it in a spirit of gentleness so that you both experience unity. That's why we confront. We aren't to confront sin to get our way, to expose them and make them feel bad. No, we are to confront sin so that we win the other person, so that we will be one in our experience. The Apostle Paul launches into this whole new section of Ephesians by saying that you are to be one in the church. And you are one. He says in verses four to six, there's one body, one spirit. Verse five, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. We are one. But are we experiencing that oneness. When the world looks at Emmanuel Baptist Church, do they see unity on display? When you look at your life, do you see the ugliness of pride, selfish ambition, and conceit rising up? Well, all of us need to recall the commands in this text so that we would bring glory and honor to the Lord in the church. Of course, when we think of all these things, we are to remind, be reminded that it's only possible to experience unity because God created unity for us in Christ. But of course, we will fail in these things, won't we? We will struggle. We will allow our selfishness to reign. We will allow petty, silly things to break up the blessing of fellowship and unity that we have in Christ. And we ought not to lose sight of how horrendous that actually is, that we would allow petty things to fracture what Christ has purchased for us by his blood. So it's in these moments of failure and weakness, as all of us, as we humbly come before God, can confess that we can be prideful, we can be selfish, we can put ourselves forward. What are we to do? Well, I want to encourage you with the words that our Lord Jesus gave in Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want you to know that when we do struggle to experience the pursuits of unity, that there is one who never did, and that is our Lord Jesus. He never shied from confronting sin. He never shied and hid away from dealing with error. But Christ had all of that under perfect control. He is gentle and lowly, and we are to find our rest in Christ. So if we're going to be a unified church, the ultimate answer to the question, how do we strengthen the unity of our church, is answered in the following. We need to fix our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and walk in Him. That is how we will taste and experience unity. And when that unity is on display, We are glorifying God 
and we are showing the wealth of riches that we have in Christ. May God give us the help to do these things. Let us pray.